So uh, wood-fired ceramics is a theme that kind of runs in and out through this presentation. And for those who might not be familiar with the process or the products of uh, this uh, art medium, I thought I would just give a short preface to introduce you to some of the basic ideas and to offer some visuals that you can have in mind as we, as we go through the talk. This, um, this photograph that I'm starting with, um, I took this at, I don't know, two or three in the morning in the middle of a, of a wood firing. This is um, the so-called double wide train kiln at Utah State University, um, built and maintained by the ceramics department. Um, this is not the kiln that we were firing at the time. Uh, we were firing one just on, on the other side of it. But um, you can kind of get the idea of what wood firing is like. Uh, in this uh, kiln, there's on the left-hand side, you can see a tall chimney structure that actually extends up through um, the top of the slide. So that's the chimney. And if you uh, kind of then go to the right from there, the next uh, kind of upstream chamber is the stacking chamber. So that's the long kind of horizontally oriented rectangular space. So that's where you would actually, um, before the firing, kind of crawl in and stack all of your uh, ceramic work in there, the stuff that you're trying to fire. There's that loading door on the side that's open right now, but after you'd finished stacking all of your work inside the kiln, you would brick up that door and re reseal it. Then as you go all the way to the right side of the kiln, you can see that there's another um, kind of vertically oriented rectangular structure. It has um, you know, what looks like a, a wood-fired oven door kind of in the middle of it and another smaller one down at the bottom. Those actually have um, uh, castable um, doors that can swing and close those things shut. So those are doors that you would use at various parts of the firing to actually stoke wood into the kiln. So that, that vertical rectangular structure all the way on the right-hand side of the kiln, that's that whole thing really is the firebox. And so as you're firing, throwing wood into the firebox, the wood is burning there. It's uh, spitting off a lot of ash, emitting a lot of um, uh, gases, combustible gases, and also um, fluxy alkalis. Those kind of flow through the stacking chamber on their way out the chimney. Uh, and so um, pots, when you wood fire them, are kind of constantly bathed in a very complex atmosphere that gets really extremely hot towards the height of the firing. Um, routinely, we would go to temperatures on the order of 2300, 2400 degrees Fahrenheit, or let's say 1300 degrees Celsius, if you're more oriented to that. The wood firing process itself is, uh, can be quite exciting. Uh, these are images um, from a firing of a, of a kiln that's structurally very similar to the double wide, but this is just a kind of a, a smaller scale version of the same thing. And so you can see people uh, stoking wood into the firebox. And on the right hand side, you can kind of see the flame coming, shooting out all the way uh, out the top of the chimney. And so you can imagine all of that flame and stuff has gone through the stacking chamber, right? So the pots are bathed in that kind of stuff the whole time that they're being fired. Um, in uh, this set of images, um, you can kind of see something about the pre-firing and post-firing condition of the pots that get stacked in the, in the stacking chamber. So on the left-hand side, you see a couple of people there who are actually unloading a kiln after a firing. So that's the kind of loading door that we also saw on the first slide. Um, this is a smaller kiln than the image on the first slide, but you can see somebody sitting in there uh, taking some pots out of the stacks after they've been fired and handing them out to somebody. So if you kind of crawl in that door, and then um, this image, this photograph that's in the center of the slide, that's a view looking towards the chimney at um, some uh, stacks of pots that have already been placed in there. And this is actually, this photograph is from the very first firing of this particular kiln, which is why it looks so clean inside. But you get an idea of what the pots look like before they're fired. So most often in wood firing, we'll put pots in there that are completely unglazed. So the color that you're seeing uh, on these pots is basically the color of the clay. And these have already been bisque fired for those of you who know what that is. Um, and you know there are a few different kinds of clay represented. So there are whiter looking clays that are more like porcelain. There are kind of uh, pinkish looking clays which are um, have some more iron. Those are high fire stonewares. But so the image on the very right hand side of this slide, so that's more or less the same view, but after the firing was over. So this is something like a two, two and a half day firing. And then you have to let the kiln cool for a couple of days before you can unbrick the loading door and go in and start to pull stuff out. But you can clearly see all of the ash that's accumulated all over the floor. A lot of that ash fell on, the, you know, that similar kind of ash fell on the pots where <clears throat> ash uh, falls on the ceramic surfaces. It can actually kind of fuse in or even melt and form glassy drips. And then also this exposure to the complex uh, hot kiln atmosphere 
and induces a, quite a bit of change in the surface color and texture of the clays itself. So in this image, you can see <clears throat> towards the bottom of the stack that you pick up some blues and grays, a little bit hard to see in this image, and then going up towards the top where things have a little bit less um, contact with all that ash, you'll get um, what we think of as flashy colors that are more like um, oranges or, or reds or pinks. In the next few slides, I just uh, present some uh, more kind of studio photographs of wood-fired pots uh, so that you can get a better look at what these lo things look like after they've been taken out of the kiln and, and cleaned up. Um, but you can see you know, those orangey flashing colors or kind of darker purple flashing colors on the piece all the way on the right, these blues and grays that form. Uh, and then on the left piece and the piece in the middle, you can see this kind of thing where ash would have accumulated on a piece and then actually melted and then started to drip around the sides of the pot. So in the case of both of those pieces on the far left and in the middle, um, those were stacked into the kiln, not upright like this, but over on their sides. And so by following the kind of direction of those drips, uh, you, can, you can see which direction was gravity uh, while the pot was actually being fired. And you know, again, let me just emphasize, these pots went into the kiln completely unglazed. Uh, they were just you know, a sort of pinkish beige color. And so all of these, this variation in the surfaces and uh, all the different colors that form, you know, these are really just a result of, uh, you know, the clay itself interacting with the ash in the complex kiln atmosphere. And then something about, you know, the orientation in which these pots were stacked into the kiln and uh, how the actual flow of ash and gases through the stacking chamber changed um, over the course of the firing, depending on how hot things were, what the condition of the chimney was, et cetera. Uh, just some more visuals to, to show you kind of the variety of different colors that can be developed on unglazed clay in a wood firing. The piece in the very middle, actually a couple of the pieces here have what look like shell marks. So those are actually from having stacked those things on top of seashells during the firing. And uh, one last image here, more wood fired work. So that's the end of my little preface, and uh, what I'll do now is then um, jump into presenting this uh, this presentation uh, in, in a way that I've presented it for uh, seminar audiences in the past. I'd like to start by reading an excerpt from an article titled, Fighting the Mountain, Some Observations on the Sumerian Myths of Inanna and Ninurta, published in 2004 by Fumi Karahashi. This excerpt presents her plot summaries of these myths from the late third millennium BCE. Quote, two Sumerian mythological compositions share the motif of a god fighting a mountain. One, Inanna and Ebi, tells how Inanna fights and conquers Mount Ebi. The other, Lugal-e, tells how Ninurta, Inanna's male counterpart, campaigns against Asag, which may symbolize a stone or a mountain. Inanna and Ebi begins with an introductory hymn in praise of Inanna. Inanna goes around heaven and earth and then resolves to attack Mount Ebi because she feels that it does not show her proper respect. She defeats Ebi and then tells the mountain why she attacks it. Lugale starts with an introductory hymn in praise of Ninurta. At a banquet with the gods An and Enlil, Ninurta's weapon Sharur informs him of the creation of a mysteriously strong opponent, Asag who, together with an allied army of stones, threatens Ninurta's authority. Ninurta engages in the battle and finally defeats Asag and its allies. In the following section, Ninurta piles up the defeated stones to construct a dam and thereby brings the mountain waters down to the Mesopotamian plain for agriculture. The story ends with Ninurta blessing and cursing the different stones and establishing their properties." End of quote. From these storylines, we may perhaps infer that there was a time long ago when people could accept the attribution of volition and agency to what today we would consider inanimate objects. In this case, stones and mountains, not to mention Sharur, the talking mace. The stones and mountains in these myths are capable of assuming disrespectful attitudes and of fomenting revolt. They are deserving of blessing or cursing and of explanation in the wake of divine retribution. They are integral actors in the genesis of civilization, acting in concert or contention with gods to establish worldly orders facilitating agriculture, architecture, metallurgy, and commerce. Far from being mere substrate for human agency, abiotic matter in this ancient Sumerian cosmos participated actively in events of tremendous import. 
Fast forward roughly four millennia, we find ourselves on the far side of the Enlightenment and the scientific and industrial revolutions, with prevalent modern attitudes of human exceptionalism in which animals, plants, and earth have come to be viewed largely as resources for our growth and development. Mankind's apparent dominion beneath the heavens, as represented in the medieval conception of a great chain of being, is codified in today's dominant capitalist paradigm. I'm not sure how well you can see details of the graphic on the left. This is an engraving from 1579 illustrating the idea of the great chain of being. Mankind is a step below the angels, then down to animals, plants, fire, and finally rocks. Humans have learned to domesticate crops and livestock and to modify them genetically. We've learned to purify elements such as silicon and uranium and put them to various uses and to make new materials such as steel and carbon fiber. We're developing machines that can explore deep space or find patterns in data beyond human mental capacity. Generally speaking, we no longer think of stones and mountains as independently minded actors contributing to the grand narrative of history. Rather, the story revolves mainly around how humans decide to use them. But of course, it's not that simple. In 2010, political theorist Jane Bennett published a highly influential book called Vibrant Matter, in which she presents extended arguments for a new ethical political stance she calls vital materialism. Vital materialism flattens the ladder of being to put all of us animate and inanimate earthlings on a single equitable level, people, dogs, trees, mud, and fire. Perhaps we could think of it as a postmodern return to more ancient ways of relating to the cosmos. In introducing the basic idea of vital materialism, Bennett writes, quote, it is no longer so controversial to say that animals have a biosocial, communicative, or even conceptual life. But can non-organic bodies also have a life? Can materiality itself be vital? Does life only make sense as one side of a life matter binary? Or is there such a thing as a mineral or metallic life, or a life of the it in it reigns? I think that there is, and that there are good ecological and biotechnological reasons for us to get better acquainted with it." End of quote. Bennett's book elaborates upon a number of these reasons for developing vital materiality, the most accessible of which is perhaps her approach to retooling the environmentalist movement. Uh, quote, in response to a series of practical problems, including Hurricane Katrina, expensive gasoline, tornadoes in months and places where they had not normally occurred, the dead and tortured bodies from the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan, and pathogens in spinach, hot peppers, chicken, and beef produced by long distance factory farming, an American public seemed to be coalescing. Stirred from their fatalistic passivity by a series of harms, some members of this public began to note aloud, in the news and schools on the street, the self-destructive quality of the American way of life. Environmentalism, invented in the 1970s, was making a comeback. But I do wonder whether environmentalism remains the best way to frame the problems, whether it is the most persuasive rubric for challenging the American equation of prosperity with wanton consumption, or for inducing, more generally, the political will to create more sustainable political economies in or adjacent to global capitalism. Would a discursive shift from environmentalism to vital materialism enhance the prospects for a more sustainability-oriented public?" End of quote. As to what the alternative narrative of vital materialism actually is, she writes, quote, the story will highlight the extent to which human being and thinghood overlap, the extent to which the us and the it slip slide into each other. One moral of the story is that we are also non-human and that things too are vital players in the world. The hope is that the story will enhance receptivity to the impersonal life that surrounds us and infuses us, will generate a more subtle awareness of the complicated web of dissonant connections between bodies and will enable wiser interventions into that ecology." End of quote. And in another passage, quote, if environmentalists ourselves who live on Earth, vital materialists ourselves who live as Earth, who are more alert to the capacities and limitations of the various materials that they are, end of quote. So the spirit of vital materialism could be summarized roughly as an attempt to do away as much as we possibly can with all of our implicit assumptions about hierarchies of being to try to embrace what other contemporary thinkers such as Graham Harmon have called flat ontology. Much of what this means for Bennett is learning to think of even inanimate matter as having agency, much like the stones and mountains from Sumerian mythology, and to think of ourselves not as imposing form and transformations upon matter, but rather as, collect, uh, sorry, as collaborating with things and their natural processes 
to try to address our wants and needs. Bennett wants us to learn to think about interacting with the awesome forces of weather systems to redirect flows of mechanical energy into the incomprehensibly complex network of temperamental machines and competing self-interested computer algorithms known as the electric grid, rather than harnessing wind power for sustainable electrification. Or to boil it down to more modest terms that uh, are already familiar in traditional craft circles, Bennett wants us to think of working with materials in the same way that we think of working with a human partner. Bennett worries that this is a tall order for most people and wonders about the formulation of yogic practices to help us towards her envisioned enlightenment. Quote, I have come to see how radical a project it is to think vital materiality. It seems necessary and impossible to rewrite the default grammar of agency, a grammar that assigns activity to people and passivity to things. Are there more everyday tactics for cultivating an ability to discern the vitality of matter? End of quote. In a partial answer to her own question, she elsewhere muses, quote, vital materialists will thus try to linger in those moments during which they find themselves fascinated by objects, taking them as clues to the vital materiality that they share with them, end of quote. And this brings me finally to one of the main points I want to make in this talk, that the practice and the products of wood-fired ceramics testify viscerally and compellingly in favor of vital materialism. Let's try to develop that point gradually. The basic idea that things can exercise various kinds of agency in their involvements with other animate and inanimate matter has many origins, but many point to a widely read book by anthropologist Alfred Gell titled Art and Agency and, Anthropo and Anthropological Theory, published in, 19 in 1998. This slide shows a brief quote from that book, quote, the index is, in these instances, a congealed trace of the artist's creative performance. Much post-Renaissance Western art projects the artist's agency in a very salient manner. The brushwork in works by Van Gogh emanates an almost palpable sense of the artist's presence, smearing and dabbing the still viscous oil paint. Jackson Pollock's drip paintings provide even more striking examples. They have no subject at all except the agency of Jackson Pollock himself. They are non-representational self-portraits of a man in frenzied ballistic activity." End of quote. The image on the left is a digital copy of a 1984 photograph by Louise Lawler, a kind of still, left, uh, still life arrangement with part of a Jackson Pollock painting and a ceramic soup tureen. With our trained eyes, we quickly note the resonances of color and line between the painting and the ceramic brushwork, which are all the more striking for the extreme differences of manner. Despite these differences, getting back to the quote by Gell, I think it's fair to say that we can recognize both marked surfaces as traces of an artist's creative performance. So then, what of the marked surfaces of these wood-fired ceramic pieces? Whose creative performances are they the traces of? Recall that in the great chain of being, trees, flames, and minerals occupy the lowest rungs of the ladder. Returning to quote Jane Bennett, are there more everyday tactics for cultivating an ability to discern the vitality of matter? One might be to allow oneself, as did Charles Darwin, to anthropomorphize, to relax into resemblances discerned across ontological divides. You mistake the wind outside at night for your father's wheezy breathing in the next room. A plastic topographical map reminds you of the veins on the back of your hand. The rhythm of the cicadas reminds you of the wailing of an infant. Maybe it is worth running the risks associated with anthropomorphizing, superstition, the divinization of nature, romanticism, because it, oddly enough, works against anthropocentrism. A chord is struck between person and thing, and I am no longer above or outside a non-human environment. Too often, the philosophical rejection of anthropomorphism is bound up with a hubristic demand that only humans and God can bear any traces of creative agency. To qualify and attenuate this desire is to make it possible to discern a kind of life irreducible to the activities of humans or gods. This vital materiality is me, it predates me, it exceeds me, it postdates me." End of quote. In the wood fire ceramics community, we quite often speak of firing as a process of collaborating with the kiln and of pots painted by ash and flame, and I don't think any of us would go so far as to claim that our surfaces are completely our own rigorously intentional creations. Turning to the quote in the lower right corner of this slide, we have Immanuel Kant, uh, via Werner Pluhar's translation, speculating on the draw of natural as opposed to man-made beauty. Quote, a man who has taste enough to judge the products of fine art with the greatest correctness and refinement 
may still be glad to leave a room in which he finds those beauties that minister to vanity and perhaps to social joys, and to turn instead to the beautiful in nature, in order to find there, as it were, a voluptuousness for the mind in a train of thought that he can never fully unravel. If we think of the complex dynamics of clay, heat, and atmosphere in a wood firing as a train of thought we can never fully unravel, as I certainly do, perhaps the traces of it that we find on our favorite wood-fired surfaces may manage to provide a bit of Kant's voluptuousness for the mind in a fundamentally different way than those of a Jackson Pollock or a typical ornamented porcelain. Of course, we should take care to remember that fired pots are not static and eternal. They're never truly finished, they just go through phases of more or less rapid change. Whose creative performance is recorded here on the surface of these earthenware jars that have spent their most recent years sitting outside in the Mediterranean sun and rain? I'd now like to turn to a second recent influential book, Making, Anthropology, Archaeology, Art, and Architecture, published in 2013 by Tim Ingold. This book does a lot of things, but here I'll focus on the response he develops to the question of how to move beyond an outdated, so-called hylomorphic conception of making, as a process in which human actors impose preconceived forms on passive material substrates. Ingold's response weighs in on Jane, Sp Jane Bennett's question of how we can learn truly to internalize a worldview in which humans are not set above and apart from the material world, but rather are immersed in and enmeshed with it. Rather than emphasizing a need to think of inert matter as having agency, however, Ingold prefers the strategy of arguing that human beings themselves lack autonomous agency in their dealings with the world of plants, animals, and things. For Ingold, nothing ever gets made except through partnerships involving non-human actants. He views these partnerships as extended iterations of action and reaction that are like feedback loops, and that it becomes difficult to separate cause and effect, or agent and object. Ingold calls these extended interactions correspondences. In developing his theories, Ingold does not seem to have nearly the same level of concern with political action that Bennett has, but he does emphasize the broad importance of understanding making as an equal partnership of humans and materials for research and teaching across the social sciences and humanities. The photographs on this slide were all taken during a recent trip to the Cyclades. The first two are of ancient marble statues in the Archaeological Museum on Paros, while the third is of a stalagmite in the upper region of the cave of Antiparos. With these images as background, I'll read an extended quote from Ingold's book. I want to think of making as a process of growth. This is to place the maker from the outset as a participant in amongst a world of active materials. These materials are what he has to work with, and in the process of making, he joins forces with them, bringing them together or splitting them apart, synthesizing and distilling in anticipation of what might emerge. Far from standing aloof, imposing his designs on a world that is ready and waiting to receive them, the most he can do is to intervene in worldly processes that are already going on, and which give rise to the forms of the living world that we see all around us. In plants and animals, in waves of water, in snow and sand, in rocks and clouds, adding his own impetus to the forces and energies in play. The difference between a marble statue and a rock formation, such as a stalagmite, for example, is not that one has been made and the other not, the difference is only this, that at some point in the formative history of this lump of marble, first a quarryman appeared on the scene, who, with much force and with the assistance of hammers and wedges, wrested it from the bedrock, after which a sculptor set to work with a chisel in order, as he might put it, to release the form from the stone. But as every chip of the chisel cont contributes to the emergent form of the statue, so every drop of supersaturated solution from the roof of the cave contributes to the form of the stalagmite. When, subsequently, the statue is worn down by rain, the form-generating process continues, but now without further human intervention." End of quote. And elsewhere in the same book, uh, Tim Engold says, quote, "...the essential relation in a world in formation, as distinct from a world that we look back on, as though it were completed long ago, is not between form and matter, but between forces and materials." End of quote. It's all too easy to find examples outside the museum of what Ingold refers to as humans intervening in worldly processes that are already going on, and we are greatly helped in the analysis of such phenomena by keeping a long-term perspective. Here in this photo, we see potters David Peters and Dan Murphy climbing up to a man-made cave in a giant cliff-like kaolin deposit on the shore of the island of Kimolos, 
Of course, the geological formation was created by worldly processes that had nothing to do with humans. As for the caves, we were told that they were made by women collecting clay to use in brightening their laundry. Small human interventions in shaping the landscape, soliciting earthly contributions to the social lives of the islanders. Kaolin that would have made its way into the ocean by erosion took a different route, carried for a while on people's backs, and then back through the watershed. Uh, now we're aiming to send some of this kaolin on a substantial diversion through the world of human culture. David, Dan, and I are part of a team working to develop a porcelain clay from local Mediterranean materials, which we will, wood, which we will uh, wood fire using traditional East Asian methods to create a body of ceramic art with a complex web of historic and aesthetic storylines. From there, it will take a really long time for the kaolin to move on to its next geochemical milieu, but of course, it eventually will. Sometimes we come across features in the landscape that clearly feel, feel made, even if the making extended over an indefinite period of time and involved cryptic interactions of animate and inanimate factors, perhaps even multiple generations or successions of animate factors. In the case shown here, I think it's natural to regard the creation in its current state as a product of equal contributions of organic and inorganic partners without any hierarchical relationship of maker and substrate. At least some of the makers seem to have fused with their material. What about these creations, now in an archaeological collection, but previously strewn about like rocks in the Aegean landscape? We have a deeply ingrained habit of seeing these as artifacts made by humans, by means of their mastery of mineral resources. But what happens if we try to follow Ingold's urging to think of them as products of merely perturbative human interventions in ongoing worldly processes? We may feel justified in emphasizing human agency in the creation of painted pottery because someone had to place selected pigments in specific locations. But then it may be worth noting that the finest clays harvested for decorative glosses in classical Athenian pottery are thought by some experts to have been Aeolian deposits carried by wind all the way from North Africa. Perhaps humans did the fine finishing in terms of relocating pigments from where they were geochemically produced, but they may not have done the heavy lifting. It doesn't take much mind bending to see the aesthetic assemblage on the right, taken towards the end of cherry blossom season in Kyoto along the Philosopher's Walk, as the product of a correspondence of human and non-human factors. We have a man-made canal, sidewalks and manhole cover, cherry trees with their blossoms and petals, and a distribution of fallen petals attributable to gravity, the flow of water, and air currents. For me, it's the distribution of the petals inlaid in the recesses of the manhole cover and completely carpeting the canal that makes the scene really interesting. Humans may have done the heavy lifting here in terms of moving materials around, but this time they didn't do the fine final placements. And we have something similar going on in the scene on the left, found in the outdoor section of a garden supply store. Man-made table and chair, painted in bright colors but succumbing to rust, the chair a perfect frame for an amazing cobweb. Both of these scenes convey a sense of transience, as some of their components are durable while others are ephemeral. As Ingold and Bennett both like to emphasize, scenes, things, communities, people never simply exist outside of time, but are always in a state of becoming. We may not like to think of the objects we make in our ceramic studio this way, but it's in the long view it's true. Quoting the contemporary Japanese potter Tsujimura Shiro, on one occasion, some of the components comprising the earth take shape by the hands of a potter. When viewed from the history of the earth, this is just a tiny moment and the creation will soon be engulfed by the ground again." End of quote. You can really feel this idea of making as corresponding with nature on many timescales, I think, when you work on outdoor site-specific installation. This is a photo of a piece I made at the Jurassi Artist Residency um, a couple of years ago. As a resident, you can propose to make and install artwork anywhere on the program's 583-acre expanse of alpine meadows and forests. The original idea for this piece came from seeing how many past residents over the years had chosen to install their contributions in and around one small section of Harrington Creek. I wanted to make a piece commemorating the agency of gravity, rocks, and water in convening what is effectively now a sculpture grove. These inanimate elements of nature worked over ages to form the creek. Trees followed the water, and artists were drawn to the resulting shade and sanctuary. The work itself incorporates rocks I lifted up from the creek bed, hanging in hand-tied rope nets from a fallen redwood with an amphora-like pot made from the local ground clay suspended between. 
I've stopped working on the installation, but of course it isn't really finished. I'm hoping the earthenware will grow some nice moss. I'm sure there will be cobwebs and maybe even some critters will move in. And the rocks are hanging low enough that in a really good rainy season, they get caught in the current of the creek. The way the pot is suspended, it will uh, be sheared into pieces if the rocks move enough, at which point the work will turn an existential corner from growth to decay. But we don't need to work out in the woods to feel, to feel that we're corresponding with materials. Many ceramists make pots whose forms and textures express the unique qualities of clay. In ceramics and other traditional craft media, that's just what we think of as materiality. To quote Tim, in, in, uh, to quote Tim Ingold again, suffice it to say that even if the maker has a form in mind, it is not this form that creates the work, it is the engagement with materials, end of quote. And in another part of his book, quote, Making, then, is a process of correspondence, not the imposition of preconceived form on raw material substance, but the drawing out or bringing forth of potentials imminent in a world of becoming. In the phenomenal world, every material is such a becoming, one path or trajectory through a maze of trajectories." End of quote. In ceramics, we like to distinguish between form and surface, and one of the reasons many of us like wood firing is that it provides a means to achieve surfaces that are lively and sometimes surprising, yet organically complement the forms we put in the kiln and respond to decisions we make about how we stack work in the kiln and how we adjust our stoking over the course of the firing and cooling cycle. But to try to relate ceramics practice to the ideas of thinkers like Bennett and Ingold, rather than thinking about the forms we create and the surfaces we choose to finish them with, let's see what we can do to inhabit their ideas about making as a correspondence of forces and materials. For the remainder of the talk, I'll be focusing on reduction-cooled dark clay surfaces such as the ones shown here. Lately, I've been especially interested, both artistically and scientifically, in what we call reduction-cooled reds. By this, I'm referring to the types of purple to vermilion highlights on gray to black backgrounds that we often find on clay bodies or clay slips with a few percent or more of iron oxide by weight. The pieces on the left of this slide show some of these highlights in context, the images on the right show what they look like at higher magnification. The, uh, the brown spot with the red flare uh, towards the upper right is about one centimeter per scale. And here on this slide, I just uh, include a couple more images of work to show how prominent um, these reduction red sorts of surfaces can be in some cases. Abstract notions of color, red, brown, black, are actually ridiculous oversimplifications when we speak about wood-fired ceramic surfaces. It's like saying that a forest is green or that the earth is blue. You can't really talk about color independent from texture and form if you care about details. Experiencing this deeply in the context of wood-fired ceramics is, I think, a great moment of vital materialism in Jane Bennett's sense. What we perceive from a distance as reduction cool red is in fact just the coarsest possible characterization of an incredibly rich clustering of nanocrystal structures that form when we fire iron-bearing clays with delayed reoxidation. As I learned from a recent book by Graham Harmon, the early 20th century Spanish philosopher José Ortega y Gasset once wrote, referring to a red leather box on the desk in front of him, but will apply the spirit of what he's saying to a red wood-fired pot, quote, there is the same difference between a pain that someone tells me about and a pain that I feel as the red is between the red that I see and the being red of this red leather box. Being red is for it what hurting is for me." End of quote. A bit more esoterically, we can relate a widely quoted passage from Adorno's Negative Dialectics, quote, The name of dialectics says no more to begin with than that objects do not go into their concepts without leaving a remainder. It indicates the untruth of identity, the fact that the concept does not exhaust the thing conceived. End of quote. So making and studying and appreciating wood-fired ceramics are powerful ways of understanding that earth and fire are not just tools and resources. They are world worldly processes of unknowable depth and complexity. So <clears throat> the images on this slide um, show these sort of reduction red surfaces at uh, a couple of different levels of detail. Uh, if we look on the lower left here, for example, you see that there are these um, uh, kind of box-like ceramic pieces. And on the undersides that are exposed down there, you can see where these reduction cool red uh, textures and colors have developed. Now, if you take one of these things and stick it into a microscope and look at it at much higher magnification, uh, you, uh, well, that's the image that's on the right hand part of this slide. And you can see that that red color actually uh, incorporates uh, 
quite a wide, wide variety of different tones of red, ranging from the almost purple to very bright ketchupy sorts of reds. But then it's uh, kind of permeated throughout with these tiny little black crystals and even some funny little um, white or silvery sort of patches. And what we're going to do on the next few slides is to use some tools of modern microscopy to take an even closer look at what these surfaces are like at super high magnification. And to go to those really high magnifications, we need to use an, a scanning electron microscope. And, um, you know, unfortunately, in a scanning electron microscope, we don't get to see things in color. So one thing we'll have to do in order to follow um, the details that I want to show you is to get used to registering um, what things look like in a regular optical microscope, you know, the kind of thing that you could just uh, look through some lenses with your eyes and see just a magnified color image. Uh, into kind of fine landmarks so that you can associate uh, details of the surface uh, as you would see them with a magnifying lens and then kind of uh, cross over to the, the electron microscope image and see those same features and kind of appreciate their, their uh, very detailed morphology at even higher magnifications. So in this slide, in the lower right-hand corner, there's an optical microscope image. And in the center of that frame, there's a silvery kind of a ginkgo leaf shaped thing, or maybe it looks like a, a manta ray. And that's surrounded by a halo of the very um, rich red. But then throughout it, you can see that there are these um, little black crystal sorts of things. Now, if you go over to the left side of this slide, hopefully you can make out that um, beginning in the very center of the frame and extending off to the left a little bit down, you have that same funny um, ginkgo leaf shaped uh, thing. Uh, and around it, there's a halo of uh, kind of what looks like snow, but particularly dense snow. And then here and there, you also have these, uh, these uh, patches that look much more glassy or icy. And I think if you look back and forth between the color photo and the electron micrograph, you can make out that the silvery and red areas are the really dusty, powdery, snowy um, patches in the SEM image. And where you have the black crystals in the optical image, and those correspond to the icy, glassy, smooth uh, areas on the electron micrograph. For, for a scale bar um, on the electron micrograph, uh, on, on the lower right of it, you can see a scale bar for 300 microns. And just to remind you, that's about a third of a millimeter. Uh, and uh, typically people would say that the width of a human hair is about 80 microns. Now, another sort of thing that you can do with a tool like a scanning electron microscope is to look not just at the detail, detailed morphology or kind of topography of the surface, but you can also resolve where certain elements are clustered. So um, what I'm showing in this uh, slide, so there's that same optical frame in the very lower right-hand corner. And then maybe the thing to look at is just to its left, um, there's another uh, monochrome uh, image that is labeled with uh, SIK under bar ROI. So what that is, is it's, an, it's a close-up of just, you know, the kind of leaf part of the ginkgo leaf feature. But now the brightness of the pixels in this silicon image are showing you the relative concentrations of um, silicon atoms on the surface of the, of, of the, on the ceramic surface. So you can see that the very bright areas, hopefully you can line those up to note that they correspond to the shiny black crystally features that you can see in the optical uh, microscope image. If you go above that silicon map <clears throat> to the one labeled FEL underbar ROI, so that map is a, a similar kind of intensity map, but showing you now where the iron is. And so you can, what you can see from that <clears throat> is that the silvery and red areas have very high concentrations of iron, but those glassy black inclusions are very low in iron. Um, in fact, it's, it's iron that's primarily responsible for the colors that we see on this sort of a surface. And the graphs that are on the left part of the slide just serve to establish um, a very interesting fact, which is that when we look at the most intense red areas that we can find on this sort of a, a ceramic piece, uh, the, the analytic capabilities of the electron microscope tell us that those patches of the surface appear to be something like, you know, 50% or even more iron, which is uh, strange at first because the clay that we're using, the clay itself is only something like 2 or 3% iron. So somehow when these reduction cool red surfaces form, there's a drastic increase in the concentration of iron uh, kind of on these uh, bright red surface patches.
Um, getting back to kind of texture and morphology, so there's that same uh, optical field of view on, on the lower right, and there's a yellow X there in the middle of the silvery area, and now when I'm showing you on the left-hand side, it's just what that area looks like at super high magnification in the electron microscope. Um, so the scale bar now is five microns there, so we're really looking in at a very high level of detail, and it's a, it's a very interesting sort of surface texture. If we look at those bright red areas, so um, we get a characteristic um, type of morphology for reduction cool reds, where it looks like you have kind of almost um, uh, piles of, of uh, grains of sand or something like that. These are really, you know, very, very small uh, iron oxide crystals. So note the scale bar here is now all the way down to three microns. So these are really super tiny, uh, a very, very fine grain kind of powder that builds up on the surface that, that, uh, that creates these vibrant reds. And then um, it's a little bit hard to make out from the placement of the, uh, the X in the lower right, but this um, electron microscope um, image, uh, the scale bar is again, five microns. So, you know, I kind of describe this as looking like a frozen lake uh, surrounded by a rubbly sort of shore. And so that rubble along the um, left and top edges of the frame, this is more of that bright red reduction cool surface. And then the smoother, icy, kind of frozen lake looking part of it, this corresponds to one of those glossy, uh, glossy black crystals. So you can make out that there's a, a tremendous um, difference in, in the texture there, going along with that difference in um, elemental composition and uh, in, in the visual appearance of those two different areas. But if you study the frozen lake surface a little bit more, maybe you can make out that there are actually kind of piles of grains or columns of those little grains of iron oxide looking like they're actually trying to bust up through the frozen surface of the lake. In fact, if you zoom in even more, so here's a two micron scale bar, but I think in an image like this, you can really make that out. So for example, in the lower left-hand corner, it looks like there's a, a kind of a puncture through the frozen surface of the lake and these grains of iron oxide are really just literally trying to, to spill out. Um, Maybe that's a clue about how we develop this surprisingly high surface iron percentages that I discussed a few slides ago. In fact, if you search through the scientific literature on iron and aluminosilicate melts, there are some groups of papers that, um, that show that iron, as well as magnesium ions, can be pushed or pulled out of the surface of a hot glass under reducing or oxidizing conditions. But apparently for this to happen, for oxidation to occur by pulling iron to the surface rather than by oxygen diffusing into the surface to find buried iron. Reoxidation needs to be delayed to happen at a lower temperature than we usually hold before shutting down a firing. All these articles deal with specific material and firing conditions that are somewhat different from what we have in wood-fired ceramics, but it's, uh, it's very tempting to think that there should be a connection. For the purposes of our talk here today, I think the essential point is that oxidation and reductions are forces we exert on our materials not so different than when we pull clay up on the wheel, just at a very microscopic scale. Oxidation and reduction are not just about changing the chemical state of the metals in our gla clays and glazes. There are also tools we have for moving matter around, at least uh, iron and magnesium atoms anyway. This sort of insight may or may not have any deep implications for how wood-fired ceramists approach making. But I do find something dramatic in the idea of sucking iron up out of the depths of a clay body, like something Magneto would do, to use a pop culture reference, or to be more classic, like drawing blood from a stone. Quoting again from Adorno, it is when things in being are read as a text of their becoming that idealistic and materialistic dialects touch. End of quote. Looking at this electron microscope image, we not only see a structure, but are prompted to envision the dynamic forces of vital materialism that created it. And again from Tim Ingold, to correspond with the world, in short, is not to describe it or to represent it, but to answer to it. It is to mix the movements of one's own sentient awareness with the flows and currents of animate life. End of quote. It's up to each of us to decide how we want to respond, for example, in the kinds of pots we choose to make. But in the long history of the development of wood fire ceramics, I like to think that modern micros microscopy gives us striking new ways of listening to what our materials are saying. As I move into my final few slides here, I want to recall that the complex processes we correspond with in wood-fired ceramics are not so different from those that work in geology. When we wood-fired clay, which is basically weathered material of the Earth's crust, 
There are fluxes in the kiln atmosphere, sodium and potassium, that help to liquefy the outer skins of our pots, forming aluminosilicate melts that are not so different from magma. When the pots cool, crystals form out of the melt in a manner not so different from what happens when a volcano erupts and gemstones form from the cooling lava, just on a much smaller and faster scale. What I'm, uh, the kind of graph that I'm showing in the upper left-hand part of this slide are some uh, Raman spectra. And uh, so in looking at the, so there's a black data trace here and a red data trace. Um, the horizontal axis uh, corresponds to basically a vibrational frequency. And when comparing data traces, you don't need to look at the super exact shape of the traces, let's say of the red one versus the black one, but really what, you're, where, what you want to note is where along the horizontal axis do the peaks occur? So I think that if you line up the peaks in the black and the red data traces, they have different relative sizes, but you can see that the positions of the peaks are essentially the same for most of the way across the axis. And what's neat about that is that one of these traces is a Raman spectrum uh, taken from a, a ceramic shard, uh, a reduction cooled red ceramic shard. And then the other one was taken from this rock that's pictured in the middle of that, in the middle of that graph. And that's something that I bought uh, on erocks.com. It's a, it's a geology um, auction site. And so that's a, a rock that was found in a cave and it's described as hematite overgrowth on a kind of mineral called analcine. So the similarity between these two Raman spectra really just go to, uh, to emphasize how similar the kinds of surfaces are that we obtain in, in wood-fired ceramics to the kinds of things that are produced by natural geological processes and forces. So I think it's really neat how ceramics in general, and wood-fired ceramics in particular, is so entwined with the forces and materials of geology on both macro and micro scales. To pick up on another line of thought from Jane Bennett's book, I'll read a brief quote she references from a paper by geographer and social scientist Nick Bingham. And this is from Bees, Butterflies, and Bacteria, Biotechnology and the Politics of Non-Human Friendship. Uh, and so here in this quote, he's tying together some ideas that he gathers from other authors. Quote, what Taman, Derrida, and Haraway together help us to consider, then, is whether friendship might be better characterized not, as has traditionally been the case, by the sorts of entities it links, but, rather, by a certain quality of being open to and with others. Although we cannot speak with non-humans in any straightforward way, even if any straightforward way of speaking existed, what we can, and more importantly do do, is become articulate with them in various ways." End of quote. Hence, I think Bingham and Bennett might support the notion that working in wood-fired ceramics is one way of being with the earth as better friends. And just to tie everything back to where we started, I thought I would end by reading some lines from the part of Lugale in which Ninurta is passing judgment on various stones that took part in Asag's rebellion. Here he addresses the truth stone, which was among the stones that ultimately left the rebellion and proved loyal to Ninurta. This is from the translation of Torkild Jakobsen. Quote, the warrior stepped over to the truth stone, called out to it in its strength. Truth stone, whom I reclaimed from the rebel region, not in violence did my hand reach you, nor did I fetter you along with the defiant ones, but united the nation at your feet. Among the wise ones knowing everything, may you be dear to them like gold. End of quote. A translator's note to this passage reveals that the truth stone is none other than hematite, the very same iron oxide mineral that we saw busting through the surfaces of our wood-fired ceramics to form reduction cool reds. Perhaps it's no surprise, then, that this material presents itself thus to testify for vital materialism. It has a long agential legacy and divine mandate to boot.